Hello everybody and welcome. I am Mana Cryptic and welcome to the Cryptic Cast. This is the second episode that we're going to be doing and instead of reviewing an entire format today and what on earth happened to it, you're not actually going to be even seeing my face at all in this video. However, you will be seeing my deck list. Now, this deck list may look a little bit strange to you considering the fact you immediately are drawn to the land count, which is under a quarter of the deck. I know, I know, but bear with me. This is an incredibly competitive, incredibly slow-paced deck that is aiming to grind your opponents out of the game completely. Are you guys ready? Because this is not going to be an intro. This is Cryptic Cast. So if you go ahead and look immediately up on my EDH profile, I, my name is Phoenix219 on my EDH profile. This is where I build a lot of my decks. You can check me out. There's a whole bunch of decks on my profile, but this deck is called Hakori Stacks. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it right about there so you can actually go ahead and see everything. There's 59 symbols in the deck, which is relatively low. These are all white things, and there's almost nothing with two mana symbols in it. Yes, I do recognize that most of my sorceries have two mana symbols in them, and Elspeth has two mana symbols in her, but if you look through the rest of almost everything, aside from Aura of Silence, that's four life. That's Return to Dust. And then this is almost all aside from just a couple examples in there, aside from Avacyn as well, one mana symbol. So you really don't need that much white mana in this deck. You only need to get a couple of these snow-covered planes. Now remember that because that's going to be incredibly important for later. But initially, let's look at what our commander does, Hakori Dust Drinker. Lands don't untap during their controller's untap steps. Okay, that's a huge pain. Now, during each player's upkeep, that player untaps a land he or she controls. You suddenly realize why I have all of these crazy amounts of artifacts. Now, what that allows me to do, I'll just go ahead and highlight a mirror here. What that allows you to do is that causes you to go from this sort of really dinky deck that doesn't really get a lot of mana out to 38 mountains, mana, 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 defense. Mana. I actually don't know why. Oh, I do know why this is in the deck. Protection. Mana. You get what I'm getting here. Each spell costs three more to cast. This is Hakori Stacks. Now, if you don't know what Stacks is, it's based around a very old card called Smokestack. Smokestack, as you can see, is the worst. I hate Smokestack so much, but it's so beautiful in this deck. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may, keyword there is may, put a soot counter on Smokestack. During each player's upkeep, that player sacrifices a permanent for each soot counter on Smokestack. You can get to the point where this has six, has six soot counters on it, and players are just sacking off their boards. They don't have anything left to do. You have to, get, you have to find a way to get rid of Smokestack and then return your board to the field. And remember, it says permanent, not non-land permanent. That's another incredibly important thing. Some of the major highlights of this deck are cards like Sun Titan, which allow you when it enters the battlefield, the ETB effect, allows you to pull anything of this range out. It allows you to pull your Mana Crypts and your Mox Opals out. It allows you to pull out, I would say, a solid at least 40% of your deck. Because all of this gets pulled out by Sun Titan. And then all of this is your high end. All of this, 8.5 tells gets pulled out by Sun Titan if it's in your graveyard. All of this stuff is once you've locked your opponents out of the game with a combination of Hakori and Cataclysm and Austere Command and Tragic Arrogance is Wrath of God, Terminus, Dusk to Dawn, Armageddon. Once you've just wiped their board clean and you have things like Platinum Angels out, you have things like Magus of the Tabernacle out, you're locking down your opponents, you eventually get out Iona. You eventually get out Elishnorn. You eventually get out Avacyn. Those three things... My favorite combo in this deck, just a small aside, is Avacyn plus Armageddon. You play Avacyn, you play Armageddon, none of your lands get blown up, all of your opponent's lands get blown up. It's a super late game combo, but this deck wants to get to the late game. Now, considering the fact that things, now, considering the fact this says sacrifice, however, Terminus says bottom of the library, Cataclysm says sacrifice. It doesn't care your shit is indestructible, it just cares that it's now dead. This thing does manipulate with thematic compass, allowing you to remove attack and comp allowing you to maze of ith whenever you would like to. Uh, Pearl Medallion does reduce the cost of everything by one, considering everything in this deck is white, as you can see. 
these are all things that produce white mana, and then this is, for some reason, the mirror is sorted differently. I don't really understand why. As you can see, it is the standard 100 cards. This was last updated three days ago. It's also made three days ago. I'm doing a challenge over on my Instagram, most likely if you're here from my Instagram, um, where I'm doing one deck uh, every single day. I'm doing one commander deck every single day, which is really, really exciting. It's really something that's been pretty tough on me so far. Um, making the decks is not something that I kind of just snap into. It's something that I kind of had to learn, kind of had to ease myself into a little bit. Um, considering the fact that this is a $400 deck, I would highly not suggest buying this deck. I would highly suggest tuning this deck a little bit up. I do not think this deck is in its ideal form yet. Um, but I did want to give you a little bit of a, de a deck tech on what Hakori generally does. He's going to be locking your opponents out of the game, and I chose a stacks theme for him because that's what Hakori is very, very strong with. Uh, I do only have the one Planeswalker... Basically nothing in this deck. Come on. Basically nothing in this deck is gonna hit Elspeth. Elspeth, she can win the game on her own. You can stack up emblems infinitely. So you, you make the one ones. 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 You brick wall your opponent in front of like a wall of one ones. That's what your smoke stack's gonna be sacking off. So you just have three counters. You uptick Elspeth. You sack your three things. You're done. That's that's your sack for the turn. Whereas your opponents are sacking off like eventually their lands, their mana rocks, their big meaty creatures. Like they can't afford this. But if you have Elspeth out. You stack up her things. Now you have an army of 3-3 three, three flyers, and you have an army of 5-5 five, five flyers, and 7-7 seven, seven flyers, 9-9 nine, nine flyers. Granted, that is so many turns, but considering the fact you're going to be wanting to survive so many turns, you have cards like Linvala out. You have cards like Grand Abolisher out. You have cards like Ether's Horn Cannonist out. Uh, you even have eight and a half Tails out. Um, which, yeah, I know, I'm using the EMA art. Nah. <laughs> I love Kamigawa, but... Whatever. Anyways, that's a discussion for another day. There is only 24 lands, obviously, because your lands are going to be constantly being sacrificed. The main big hitter of this deck is Amira, considering the fact she doesn't get shuffled into your library. She doesn't get shuffled into your library. And she doesn't get shuffled into your library. Nor do nor do a couple of the... Oops, sorry. Nor do a couple of the other ones. But nothing as really big as Iona, Elshnorn, Avacyn. I pointed to one more. Yikes. Oh, Linvala. So these two. Really, those four cards, like... Obviously, if you have a price tag of more than ten dollars, I like to resurrect you with uh, with an Amira. It's pretty nice. Uh, the general theme of this deck, like I said, even the description, the title says it all. It's a Cory Smokestack. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into dealing some sample hands. Alrighty. So if we go on ahead and over to playtest. If you've never used Untap before, it's a really really great resource. Basically, what it does is it shows you as if your opponent is never playing anything. Here, you can track your life total, their life total, uh, poison just in general, and energy. I don't know why everything is black. Oh, oh, one snow... Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. It, it just took a second to think. So yes, the downside of this deck is you do mulligan... Pretty aggressively, literally, to get a mana rock. That's excellent. I have extra planar lands, winter orb, snow covered planes. Plus torp orb. So that means turn one, snow covered planes, you tap the snow covered planes, and you play a soul ring. You go ahead and tap the soul ring to play a winter orb. Winter orb immediately off the bat locks your opponents out of the game. As soon as as long as winter orb is untapped, players can't untap more than one land during their untap step. Obviously, everyone knows what soul ring does, but here's the real kicker. Snow covered planes allow you to have um, abilities like Extra Planar Lens activate, and if you have uh, snow-covered planes and not planes, then it doesn't benefit your opponents as well. So we're going to go ahead and pass the turn here. Uh, I did not draw an extra land, but I do have three mana open, but I'm not actually going to be playing it yet because I'm going to tap and I'm going to play a Torpor Orb. Creatures entering the battlefield no longer cause abilities to trigger. And now that I have Winter Orb, my one land is going to be untapping. So that means I go to my next turn, and I hit Return to Dust. Now, granted, neither of these two things are mana rocks, but what the what on earth are my opponents going to be doing? I could use Extra Planar Lens and Exile this, but that means I want to draw one more Snow-Covered Planes before I do. So before I do that, I'm going to activate Kismet. So that means artifacts, creatures, and lands my opponents control all now enter the battlefield tapped. So Kismet plus Winter Orb locks your opponents out of the game completely. They only get one land per turn. I still only have three mana open, but that's totally fine. I don't care, because my opponents most likely have one mana open. Maybe zero. <laughs> they may have nothing open right now. Considering the fact that I didn't get anything, I don't care. I go ahead and pass the turn. I now have three mana. I can play a Worn Power Stone now. 
Warm Power Stone granted does enter the battlefield tap, but this means I now have five mana open. That means I'm going to go ahead and pass the turn. There's another Snow Covered Plains. I'm going to play the Snow Covered Plains. I'm going to tap three, and I'm going to play the extra planar lens, exiling the Snow Covered Plains. Come on, buddy. Come on, buddy. Yep, there we go. Exiling the Snow Covered Plains. So now, whenever I tap this, it taps for two white mana which means I now have four mana, six mana open, which means I can already cast Sun Titan. This is turn six granted that I'm playing Sun Titan, so I'm playing it on, or sorry, it's turn seven that I'm playing Sun Titan, because uh, I had to tap the Soul Ring. Uh, but, you know, also, if anybody has anything out, return to dust. This is on my main phase. Or if there's something threatening coming at me, I'm going to play the wind, uh, Windborn Muse. So let's just say that something is threatening coming at me. So say that one of my opponents managed to get something down because they ramped out super early. They, they have an Atraxa Super Friends deck. Uh, and so I have Windborn Muse. So now the tokens that they're making, none of those are hitting me because that means they have to pay a ton of mana and their lands aren't untapping. So we're going to go to our next turn. All right, Aether Sworn Canonist. Perfect. Each player who has who has cast a non-artifact spell this turn can't cast additional non-artifact spells. That doesn't matter because I don't really have artifacts in my... Like, it, that matters because I have a lot of artifacts in my deck... And it matters because that means my opponents can no longer cast stuff unless they're running an objective artifact deck, and I have enough artifact removal that it really doesn't matter for me. So I'm going to go ahead and tap six mana to bring out Sun Titan. I don't even care that there's nothing in my graveyard. It's a 6-6 six, six beater that can hit face, which is a really important thing. Now my Enter the Battlefield trigger does not activate, but keep in mind, Winter Orb isn't hurting me. Winter Orb is untapping my singular land per turn. Oh look, there's another one. So despite the fact that I'm only untapping one land per turn, still, I tap two, I get four mana that turn, the next turn I only get two mana. That's not a huge deal for me. It's a bit of ramp and it's super quick ramp, but considering the fact I have two mana rocks out already, and I have a Return to Dust and an Aether Sworn Cannonist, let's go ahead and hit it. Let's go ahead and do this. We're going to play the Aether Sworn Cannonist. I generated four mana just by tapping two things. Aether Sworn Cannonist. Bam. Spirit of the Labyrinth. Players can't draw more than one card per turn. Bam! Let's go ahead and throw that out there. I actually didn't even need to tap two. I could have only tapped the snow-covered planes. Bam! Spirit of the Labyrinth. Now we can only draw one card per turn. This is turn nine. Granted, I did start with a soul ring in my hand, but that doesn't matter for this deck. Obviously, I drew a little bit land light, uh, but and getting the extra planar lands was a huge help, and getting the soul ring was a huge help, but you could still do it with a winter orb and two lands instead of a soul ring. And you could do it with a torpor orb, and Kismet is just killing it. You don't see the full value of this deck until you really understand this deck is supposed to be played against people. This deck is supposed to stand there and go, I dare you to move me. And then people poke it and prod it and throw sticks and stones at it. And it laughs, a bellowy laugh, as you untap your land and you tap two mana and you tap your, or sorry, you tap Four mana thanks to your extra planar land. That's actually probably a bad idea. Four lands have the one power zone. You bring out Hakori Dust Drinker. Now, no lands untap during their untap step, making Winter Orb even better. So during their untap step, they can only untap one land still, but this is a creature now. See? If you combo these two together, they can remove one of them, they can remove the other one, they still do the same effect. And if you want to ever untap all your lands, here's the Sword of Feast and Famine. So we can go ahead and tap down. That is, keep in mind, that is four mana right there that I just tapped down to play the Sword of Feast and Famine. Pretty good. Then we go to the next turn. And still one of my things is tapped. But then I have Tangle Wire. Yeah! <laughs> I think that you guys are beginning to understand the point of this deck. In, four, in a little under 15 minutes... You got to see my horrible Donald Duck weird laugh thing that I do sometimes on videos. You got to see how this horrific deck works. Here, I wanted to roll some dice. You got to see how this horrific, horrific deck works and how insufferably mean this whole thing be can be. Thank you very much for joining me on the short episode of the Cryptic Cast. We'll be back in a week, maybe with a deck tech, maybe with some pack openings, and maybe with a special surprise just for you viewers at home. Thank you. Have a fantastic day. Metacryptic, out.